Thing with audio. Cool bananas. Everyone, I am the host. Yay. Admitting everybody. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Okay. Lots of people are joining the party. Awesome, awesome. Ten people are waiting to join. So many people. Good evening, boys and girls. Okay. Um, nice to see that we got a nice merry crowd of people joining. Um, I'm just admitting everybody before I go on with the party. Okay, cool. So let's go to share screen. And let's begin our slideshow. And I'm going to admit, admit everybody. Okay, cool. So good evening, guys and girls. Uh, welcome to the party. And tonight we are doing a two-part series on birds. So the first session is on the evolution of bird, which is arguably one of the most interesting things you could probably ever learn in your entire life, especially if you're a fan of dinosaurs. So tonight, book of the week, actually there's going to be two books this week, but it's book one of the week, is The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. And it is, in my opinion, probably the most important book on biology that you'll ever read in your entire life. It's not about being selfish. It's about how genes behave in a selfish way. And it explains animal behavior, it explains uh, how certain traits evolve in animals and how it explains how communities and uh, ecology actually work. It's a really, really interesting book. And I've read it about four times in my life. I'm probably gonna read it next year as well, or this year if I've got time. And I advocate everyone get a copy, okay? You can download it off the net for free, but buy a hard copy is far better in my opinion, uh, because you're supporting the author and also it's just nice to own a hard copy. You can get it from Amazon, Goodreads, any good bookstore, even exclusive books has copies of it. Okay, so on to birds. Birds are basically reptiles with airs of pretension. Birds share an overwhelming series of similarities with other reptiles. They are both genetically and phenotypically very similar. The word phenotypically means appearance-wise. And you think, what, is, what does birds share in appearance with reptiles? But actually, a lot. You'd be surprised. Now, they both have gizzards, and birds and crocodiles both have four-chambered hearts. Other reptiles only have three-chambered hearts, but birds and crocodiles, being closely related, have four-chambered hearts. Klaus, you are a little bit late. Okay. So, oh dear. So, okay. One of the big differences in the terms of these skulls is the presence of an occipital condyle. Unless you're a biologist or a vet, don't worry about this, but mammals have two, birds and reptiles have one. Remember when I'm including birds in this conversation, assume I'm mentioning reptiles as well, because they all share similar features, birds and reptiles. Okay, so birds have one occipital condyle at the back of their skull. We, being mammals, have two. If you ever happen to have a human skull, which is pretty awesome, or any sort of mammal skull, like an Inyala skull or a pig skull, which I have both, you'll see they've also got two. Okay, another big feature is that birds and reptiles have these wonderful little jigsaw uh, type jaws. They can be detached, okay? They're made up of individual bones. Mammals have one fused bone, like us, okay? Unless you've broken your bone, uh, in which case it would have fused again, obviously, but <laughs> it's a joke. Okay, so, um, Birds, you can actually physically take the bone apart, okay, quite easily. Another feature that birds and ancient, we've got a message, sorry. Uh, can't hear you. Everyone seems to be hearing me. Um, guys, if you can't hear, just send a voice message. I'm not sure why you can't hear me. My microphone is activated and it's registering. Okay, I'm getting thumbs up from people, so strange. Um, if you can't hear me, I will be uploading the YouTube video tonight, so you would be able to recap. Maybe it's a signal issue. Um, birds, okay, thumbs up from the village, Arnaldi, awesome source. Okay, so another feature is that birds and, and ancient reptiles and dinosaurs shared in common with pneumatic bones. Their bones were attached to their lungs and to their muscles, and actually as they moved, it helped air move in and out of their body, facilitating the movement of air. We have to actually physically use muscles to breathe in and out. It doesn't just happen as we move, okay? If you stand perfectly still, you still have to breathe. Birds do this as well, but if we flap our arms, I'm not getting any extra air in my lungs. Birds do. Pretty cool stuff. And dinosaurs did as well. 
Okay, another feature they have are these little urnicating processes, these little nodules on their ribs. If you ever eat KFC or any uh, awful fast food chicken, you'll see on the actual chicken wings that they've got these little urnicating processes. And those actually wrap to the ribs and actually to the muscles and actually, again, helps the, 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 the chest uh, interact with the lungs. Got two people arriving a bit late, so we're going to admit them. I apologize for all the early people. And um, another feature is that birds have a single inner ear bone. Remember, birds and mammals together. I've got a message. Okay, here, yeah, you're just fine. All right. And then, oops, go ahead, jump in the gun there. Uh, birds have scales, as do other reptiles. So we've got a cassowary foot on the left over there and a gila monster's foot on the right. You can clearly see that they both have scales. Birds do not have skin glands, much like other reptiles, which means they won't be getting any pimples when they have puberty, unlike all of us. And probably the most important thing here, this is something that you should all learn about birds, is the presence of a pectine gland. And there's this little gland in the back of the bird's eye, and some reptiles have it as well, and it pumps nutrients into the eye, making the eye far more powerful than anything you or I could ever understand. They can see colors that we cannot see. They can see waves of light we cannot see. Now, a pectine gland is something unique to all bird species and some reptiles, including crocs. Okay, we've got a couple of people still arriving. So that is something to take away from this lesson. If you learn nothing else, remember pectin gland. And of course, they both lay eggs. Not all reptiles lay eggs, all birds do lay eggs. And they have a presence of an egg tooth. All birds have an egg tooth, as do all reptiles, with those that, are, that hatch from eggs. It's this little calcium carbonate structure attached to the mouth and helps them pick away at the egg so that they can escape, otherwise they die inside the egg. And tonight we're going to be talking about one fellow, if you've done any sort of books about birds or if you've done any sort of guide training, I'm sure you've heard about Archipteryx lithographica, literally meaning uh, ancient bird set in stone, Archipteryx, ancient bird, litho, stone, graphica, okay, set in stone. It was a bird-like creature that lived 150 million years ago. and we're going to be looking at how do we get from that bloke uh, over there to this fellow over here. And the entire process took around 230 million years and three major extinction events. We're not going to cover the extinction events in detail tonight, but they played a role. The Trias extinction, which happened 180 million years ago. The Cretaceous extinction, which we all know about at the end of the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. And the Pleistocene extinction, which is arguably still ongoing um, since we're still in, the major, in a wave of a major extinction event right now. Now, going back around 300 million years ago, which is a long time ago, we're going to be talking about captahinates. And captahinates were these semi reptilian, semi amphibious organisms that lived in coastal areas um, for around 50 million years. To give you some perspective, Human beings and their ancestors, Australopithecines, have only been around for 4 million years. So just these amphibian type organisms were around more than 10 times longer than even humans and all the ancestors. So they had a really good innings. Uh, Captahinids were the most advanced terrestrial vertebrates uh, and, sorry, and they, um, from every single organism on land today, with the exception of amphibians, evolved from them. So you can see some pictures on the right there. Most of them were not this bigger than the size of a large dog. And they looked kind of like a mixture between a frog and a lizard. That's really what they were. They were the blending point between the two. That's when, they, when amphibians and reptiles started separating from each other, captahinids. And um, this is a basic diagram of where they shot off to. And we've got cotylosaurs at the bottom, bottom which is another word for captahinids. You don't have to learn the fancy names. And you can see how they shot off to the right over here, forming the pelicosaurs. If you ever grew up in South Africa and you played with toy uh, dinosaurs, I'm sure you had one of these guys over here and amongst the pack, although they weren't actually dinosaurs. Going up, you can see the therapsids over there, which gradually became mammals over the next 150 million years. Shooting up to the top, we have the ichthyosaurs, which look like a, uh, either a shark or a dolphin, depending on your imagination, but they were reptiles, full-blown reptiles. The plesiosaurs, which a lot of people say is that what the Loch Ness Monster looks like. Loch Ness Monster does not exist. Um, 
Then we have the Tuataras coming off that branch over there. Tuataras are still around 250 million years later, living off the coast of New Zealand. They are not, they are not lizards, they are cousins of lizards, and they look like iguanas, but they're completely unrelated. They are far older than the dinosaurs, and if you ever go to New Zealand, you can still see them. They're the size of a Jack Russell. And going off there, lizards and snakes evolved much later. Thecodonts, which we're going to be talking about this evening, gradually evolved into crocodiles, dinosaurs, archaeopteryx, which became the birds, and the pterosaurs or pterodactyls. Don't worry about this chart, but you can just see that all these animals today, mammals, birds, and reptiles, all came from crocodiles or capitalinids at one point about 300 million to 250 million years ago. Very long time ago, long before the dinosaurs. Okay, so what were, uh, what were Cactahanids or Cotlosaurs? They were primitive reptiles, but loosely related to ancient amphibians. Most went extinct during the Permian extinction around 250 million years ago. And every single terrestrial vertebrate today, except amphibians, descended from them, including all the mammals, meaning you. Okay, so your ancient ancestor 250 million years ago was this crummy little organism living in a swamp. Cool story. Okay. Over time, these organisms, these captahanes, gradually moved further and further inland, away from the swamp-like conditions, and started exploiting rivers, swamps, uh, forests, deserts, and a variety of other habitats. And they started evolving in size and shape. Um, as you can see from the chart over here, we've got a person arriving fairly late. They eventually became a group of lizards or reptiles called the archosaurs. And they evolved from Capitahines through natural selection over around 250 million years ago. And these were the original fossils of Capitahines. So you can see squat-like, um, quite heavy sets. They would have in, in, uh, lived in the coasts next to water, and they could afford to be fairly heavy. But over time, moving further and further away from oceanic conditions and swamp conditions, so they became thinner and more petite and elongated. And gradually, large numbers of them started walking on two legs. Some of them didn't continue to walk on two legs, like the ones at the top. But you can see the gradual shift in body structure over millions of years. And they were large crocodilian creatures that were the dominant forms of life during the early Triassic period. And they were primitive or false dinosaurs. Now, you can imagine a guy like this, and clearly crocodilian in appearance. He was about 14 meters long. One of our Nile, crocodil Nile crocodiles is about six meters, so more than double this. Okay, and they would have hunted on land. So later, archosaurs started breaking off into, into different groups. The Pseudosuchians, the, ancient, uh, the ancestors of crocodiles, as we know them today, and the Avimetatosalarians, which were the ancestors of dinosaurs and birds. And these guys appeared around the mid, uh, the mid to late Triassic. One of these guys was Scleromotus taylorii. It doesn't have a common name because you don't need to give him a common name because he's extinct. Very, very extinct. And he was only about the size of your hand, fully grown. We found juvenile forms of them as well. When I say we, I mean human species, scientists, part of the humans. And um, yeah, these guys maximum size, the size of your hand. Looks like a baby crocodile, but he ran on two legs and there he is eating a little dragonfly or what have you. Very cute. Now, why do they start to walk on two legs, you might ask? So the avimetatosalarians were still very crocodilian in appearance. As you can see, he looks like a baby crocodile. Uh, and they began to evolve a preference for walking on their back legs. Now, why the back legs? important. So the name Avimetatosolaria, say that three times without uh, getting tongue twisted, means bird-like metatarsal bones. And the ability to move on two legs granted them speed, maneuverability, and greater adaptability. So if you've got four legs, you can be heavier, but if you've got two legs, you can turn faster, you can run faster, you've got less surface area to cover in terms of your traction. You can also, you can also move over areas um, that have got rocky terrain, you can move through grasses far more effectively. You can also stalk in water without having to get into the water like modern birds. You can also loom over your prey and attack your prey from above. So being on two legs was more beneficial than being on four legs. So they gradually, over selective pressures, individuals that would tend to walk on two legs evolved. 
Another group that popped up were the pterosomorphs, otherwise known as the pterodactyls. And these guys were around from 228 million years ago until 66 million years ago, 65 million years ago. Uh, and they were flying reptiles. And they were initially quadrupeds, they walked on four legs, and over time they gradually started gliding and then eventually moved from gliding forms to full blown flying forms. And how do we know this? We can look at the bone structures and what the bones were capable of. So the earlier forms would have only been able to glide, they didn't have, they had very rigid bone structures. The later forms had very flexible bone structures and would have clearly been able to move their muscles. Also, they had elongated ridges along their pectoral muscles, which have allowed them to actually flap wings. So they would have flown like birds. They were not related to birds in any way though, in any way. Much like bats are not related to birds in any way. And they also were not dinosaurs. They came in a variety of forms also from the size of your hand, the very largest of which was the, the size of a giraffe. You can look it up, a pterodactyl the size of a giraffe, and you can imagine one of these guys flying. They would have uh, obviously specialized in hunting fish or some sort of large marine animals because nothing on land would have been able to feed them. Very large creatures. The last group we're going to be talking about, which is the dominant topic of this lecture, are the dinosaur morphs, literally the morphs of dinosaurs. And they first appeared around 242 million years ago during the mid-Triassic. And they were extremely varied. I mean, dinosaurs, as I'm sure we've watched Jurassic Park, we've watched Dino Riders, we've watched these cartoons, they had lots of different forms. And amongst these groups, we saw the first developments of birds. Okay, and one of these guys over here was a small little fellow, which was not a true dino. He was Lego Pteridae. And remember the word day means a family. These were two legged lizards or reptiles, not true lizards. And they existed for around 200, uh, the lizard existed for about 20 million years. Another of these guys, which is really interesting, would have lived in fairly cold plants, the Morosuchus, relatives of dinosaurs, but not true dinosaurs. And they were around 235 years ago. Guys, let's put your microphones on mute, please. And what you can see, I've given you guys, these, there are fossils of this, but I've given you the pictures so you can get a better understanding of what they actually would have looked like. Fossils are hard for laymen to understand. And they're covering these filamentous materials all over their body, which have obviously would have helped them insulate warmth. They weren't for flying, it just kept them warm. So they were reptilian creatures with hairs all over their body. And these hairs were not the same as mammalian hairs. They were like long, clear tubes, very similar to the base of a bird feather. Another group that we talked about also had these filamentous hairs along the back of their body were the Sinosauridae, another close cousin of dinosaurs, and they had a really good innings for nearly 40 million years. Again, for perspective, the whole of human history from Australopithecines living in caves until now, only 4 million. So they really, they were not a failure. They, they had a good, a good run. Now we come to the dinosaurs. They first started to appear, the, the groups of the Ornithischians first appeared around 200 million years ago at the end of the Triassic era. And these were called the bird hip dinosaurs. Why do we call them bird hips? As well, because when we first started finding fossils of them, we, they look like giant bird hips. That's literally what they look like. They look like a giant chicken hip or an ostrich hip. They didn't look like any animal that we'd ever seen before. So they thought were well, these giant birds. They were fossils, so they weren't bones. They were, you know, all the calcium carbon had really done. Um, decayed and become other crystallized substances. So they were long, uh, long, long, long ago. And over time, we found more and more fossils, and we realized that these were a variety of, of, of dinosaur type creatures. And I'm sure you recognize most of these guys over here. Another group of dinosaurs that came around, and through fossil evidence, we realized they actually outdated the Ornithischians, were the sauropodomorphs. They first arrived around 230 million years ago, the earliest walked on two legs, and as they grew larger and larger in size, they actually had to start walking on four legs again. Because remember, if you're heavy, you have to walk on four legs because your body weight cannot be supported on two legs. Um, and uh, Ralph's arriving late. And the word sauropodomorph literally means the lizard-footed dinosaurs because they had more lizard-like structures. They were browsers and grazers. The last group we're gonna be talking about, and again, the most pertinent group for this group, are the theropodomorphs. The theropods, thera means beast and pod means morph. So just like panthera and with uh, cats means panthera, the beast of all. The word theropod means the beast footed. 
And amongst these guys, we have Danachiosaurus, Velociraptor, Allosaurus, Tyrannosaurus Rex, Archaeopteryx, Archaeopteryx lithographica, and a variety of other two-legged dinosaurs. And these guys were characterized by hollow bones, three-clawed limbs, modified scales and feathers on all of them, completely bipedal movements, and reduced or modified frontal limbs. What animal today can you think of has hollow bones, three-clawed limbs, modified scales and feathers, and a completely bipedal movement? Now, in China, they found this reptile called Sinus, what they named Sinusopteryx, and it had these filamentous hairs on its back and body, which were very short, only 1.5 inches. And they didn't have any aerodynamic quality, but they would have obviously been some sort of insulation. And typically, these sorts of hairs don't fossilize very well because, I mean, they're, they're very, very fine and they decay so easily and they're almost never preserved. And in the past, fossils are just chopped apart and explored. But only now with more recent uh, fossil exploration methods in the 90s and 2000s, we've become very precise about uh, extracting fossils. And we've only now finding these fossils where in the past we never found them because they just blasted these, these bones out of the rocks. So all this fine evidence was never, never found. Basically, it was like going to a crime scene and using a machete to, to, to solve the crime, whereas now we use surgical equipment. Okay. So all pro in the past, we made all these assumptions about dinosaurs, but actually we realized over time these things were wrong because more exact science gave more exact evidence. One of the most common misconceptions is that the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park looks like this. Pure nonsense. It looked nothing like this. The most recent discoveries of Velociraptors clearly showed through the proper excavation techniques that they had feathers along their tails, feathers along their arms, feathers along their back. And if you actually zoom into this picture, I'm not going to zoom in because well, I don't have a zoom. I don't have a scroll button on my touchpad, but you can find this picture freely available and you can find lots of these fossils freely available on the internet. And you can see more feathers down the other arm over here. Clearly very similar to a bird in structure. And of course the, the toes and the feet are almost bird-like, like any modern bird. This is what a velociraptor would have looked like. Nothing like the movies. And if scientists had a big issue with Jurassic World because Jurassic World um, obviously knew about this and they just chose to go with the cooler, more lizard-like appearance thinking it looked more badass. But actually it's pure nonsense, completely in, uh, inaccurate, completely non-factual. This is what a Velociraptor would look like. But we don't actually know what the colors were. Um, we just, obviously, we made, we. We, just, we determined for artistic interpretation. But we know that they had feathers down the tails and feathers down the wings and feathers on the crest of the head. Velociraptors belong to a group of dinosaurs called the Dromaeosaurs. The largest guy over here uh, was um, the, the Dromaeosaurus, Albertus Danianus. And they had these long tails down there, there um, so on these long feathers down the tail. And they reckon that these tail, these tail feathers wouldn't have been for flying. They actually would have been for stabilizing the predator as he ran at high speed. Bear in mind, they reckon these guys could have run up to 85 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. Uh, and because of this, they would have had something to stabilize them. And that's, those tail feathers along their tail would have actually been able to stabilize as they ran down their prey. They also speculate that the feathers on their wings would have actually, um, on feathers on the arms would have done the same purpose. And over time, being larger and larger and becoming larger and larger, they would have facilitated flying. Okay, so another misconception is that Archaeopteryx lithographica was the direct ancestor of birds. False, okay. When Archaeopteryx lithographica was around, there were already ancestors of ostriches around. In fact, ostriches are probably the closest thing to dinosaurs alive today. So ostriches, they found fossils of ostriches dating back 90 million years. Dinosaurs were well functioning during those times. Um, for a long time, scientists first discovered that um, they discovered Archaeopteryx lithographica in the 1850s and they assumed it was an ancestor of birds. And it was a pretty good guess because no other evidence had come up. But with more recent fossils, we realized that um, the evidence through, they had separated and Fully fledged birds were well alive during the times of dinosaurs, and Archaeopteryx was something else. Archaeopteryx was, in fact, a bird called an opposite bird, so an in an ornithine, big fancy science word. 
and they claw fingers on their wings, tooth jaws, and these include Archaeopteryx. Other guys, uh, less well known, was this cute little fellow called Iberomosaurus morellianae, and he occurred around 125 million years ago, and he was about the size of a sparrow, but he had full, he had, he had tail bones like a lizard, he had a tooth jaw with scales covering his mouth, and he would have been about that size, basically a flying lizard with feathers, flying reptile with feathers. And the best quality photo I could get of the actual um, the fossil over there, set in sandstone. But this is an art, artist's interpretation of what it would, look, would have looked like. We don't know the colors because, again, we don't preserve colors in fossils. True birds, by contrast, um, some of the earliest specimens had teeth, like the very earliest. But they had true wings. They didn't have claws in their wings, they just had wings. And most of them showed signs of modern beaks, as in a keratinous sheath covering the bone rather than scales and skin. And one of the earliest birds that we know about is Yaoornus martinii. He was something that looked a bit like a chicken. Um, and again, we don't know the colors, but this is, an, this is just an artist's interpretation of how he would have looked. A fully functioning bird living around 120 million years ago during the mid uh, Jurassic period. Ichthyornis dispar was around 93 million to 183 million years ago, and he was one, he was one of the ancestors of modern birds. So, the reason why we, we speculate he's one of the ancestors of modern birds is that he um, has a lot of the same features on his skeletal structure that all modern birds share, where a lot of these other guys didn't have the same features, so they're probably never evolved from any of the species we know today. So if the, uh, if the Ornus dispar was, uh, shares a lot of the features that we, we recognize in modern birds, including ostriches. Now, 65 million years ago, the end of the dinosaurs came around, and this was through a massive meteor that hit the earth at an area today called Chicholab, which is in Mexico, South America, 65 million years ago. Wiped up 75% of all life on the planet, and it blocked that, sight complete, uh, blocked that sunlight completely for around a year. Why do we know this? It's because we find crater material or dust particles everywhere on the Earth at certain strata in the Earth's geology. And if you know anything about geology, you understand that every area has got its own geology. But one thing that we have found in common is that every area on Earth has got the same dust particles, which means that at some point, those dust particles must have covered the Earth like a blanket. So, and the only thing that could have possibly happened is that this massive dust cloud would have been in the Earth's atmosphere for ages. It would have instilled a nuclear winter simply by just the sheer amount of dust in the atmosphere that lasts for centuries. And they, they have shown through the crystalline substances in the geology that the average land temperature at this time would have been about seven degrees Celsius in the tropics. So even the tropics were miserably, miserably, miserably cold. And the world would have been uninhabitable for megafauna. Megafauna, large animals. So the world now belonged to very small mammals and very small birds. And birds, by contrast to mammals, experienced some amazing evolutionary expansions due to the number of vacant niches that were available. All these niches that the dinosaurs had taken up and the archosaurs had taken up, poof, gone. And they were allowed to exploit them and they grew rapidly in size. So for a long time, mammals had to compete with large birds for control of the earth. We're going to talk about some of these large birds now. And only in most more recent history have large mammals dominated the earth. When I say recent history, I'm talking about like our time, the last four million years, very recently. One of these guys occurred 4.5 million years ago. That's the other day. Remember, humans appeared around 4 million years ago. When I say humans, I mean hominids, Australopithecines, not modern humans. And this was a bird of prey related to eagles. He would have looked like this flightless raptor, not velociraptor, flightless bird of prey. They lived in the grasslands of Argentina and the pampas grasslands today and would have presumably be a pack hunter. Uh, they've, they've found large numbers of their fossils in communities. So they presume they were pack hunters because they would have lived in communities. Terrifying. Absolutely. The common name for this bird is the terror bird, otherwise known as the Titanus. Horrifying. Another bird that went extinct only 700 years ago, to give you some perspective, that was after the Crusades, only 150 years before the Europeans found America, was the moa, which was a 3.5 meter tall ostrich which lived in New Zealand, cousin of an ostrich. They were wiped out by the Maoris when the Maoris, those guys that play rugby today, 
arrived on the island around 700 years ago and they hunted them to extinction. They were pretty easy to kill because nothing occurred on the island at the time. Haas eagle also lived on the island of New Zealand and he also went extinct around 700 years ago because the moas were hunted to extinction and the primary food source of this eagle was wiped out. Anthropornis, pretty long time ago, but the largest penguin ever recorded was a 100 kilogram penguin that lived in Antarctica, just under two meters tall. He went extinct around 33 million years ago, about 30 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct. Pelagornis, which was a, was a really large bird, a cousin of uh, an albatross. He was around 25 million years ago, again, 40 million years after the dinosaurs went extinct. He would have been about that size. Absolutely gigantic. And you can go find these fossils. They're in museums. This is not hubu juju. These are well documented. I'll show the pictures because it's just easier to envisage. And the rest is history. There's a lot of large birds out there. We're not going to do them all because we could be here for a month going through all the pictures of the various species. It's you, uh, I leave it to you guys to so actually go do your own research and find out what kinds of birds occur out there or what kinds of birds used to occur out there. Today, we're going to go through some of the Southern African orders of birds just to give you guys some highlights of what actually occurs in our country today. Or not in our country, but in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so today's birds come in a variety of forms. Uh, while most are small, they are highly specialized and they flourish in their respective environments. Uh, we're going to brush through some of the orders of birds in the class of Aves. Class of Aves are all birds. So the capital Mugi forms are the nightjars, the most common of which is the fiery neck nightjar. Musophagy forms are the Turacos and the go away birds. They used to be called Luris, but because the whole world calls them Turacos, we've decided to call them Turacos as well. Sand grasses are the pterocly forms. Um, a lot of people think they're related to pigeons, completely unrelated to pigeons, except for the fact that they're both birds. It's like saying humans and uh, kangaroos are both mammals. You know? So uh, we're related. Occipita forms are occipita raptors, and the word raptor just means predatorial. So occipitas include eagles, hawk eagles, snake eagles, vultures, ospreys, secretary birds, harriers, kites, goshawks, sparrowhawks, buzzards, sea eagles, fish eagles, bat hawks, and hawks. So there's a lot of occipitas, and these tend to be the more heavy handed of, of the raptors. They tend to be the ones that really use brute force to kill rather than finesse. The falcons, which we'll do in a second, tend to be more finesse based and more based on intercepting, where the occipitas tend to be heavy handed, hard hitting birds, except vultures, because they're scavengers. And seriforms are ducks. Apodiforms are the swifts and saw wings, not the swallows. We, uh, I know a lot of the field guys lump swallows and swifts together. They are completely unrelated. They just look very similar through a process called convergent evolution. Okay, they occupy similar habitats, and because of that, they look very similar. Swifts are more related to night jars and to owls, where swallows are more related to weavers and sparrows and larks. Muserati forms are hornbills, but not only hornbills. They also include hoopoos wood hoopoos, and similar bills. And when you think about it, it actually makes sense. The Chadria forms are plovers and lapwings. These are not only plovers and lapwings, these are all a huge range of coastal and wetland birds. And these include plovers, lapwings, oyster catchers, thick knees or dickops as we used to call them, the snipes, stilts, painted snipes, the jacanas, the printicles, Horses, terns, shanks, sandpipers, ruffs, gulls, yes, seagulls are related to plovers, stints, and button quails. Button quails and quails are completely unrelated, even though they put them together in the field guide. Okay, they just occupy similar habitats and they look similar, but they're not related in any way. Coleal forms, which are mouse birds, Ciconia forms, which are storks, Columbia forms, which are dubs and pigeons. Coriasa forms are kingfishers, not only kingfishers, they also include rollers and bee eaters. The cuckoo forms, cuckoo forms, cuckoos and cuckoos. Falconiforms, which are falcons and their cousins, which are kestrels and hobbies. And the galliforms, a really interesting group, never get enough credit. 
and that, which are include spur fowls, jungle fowls, we don't get these in South Africa, peacocks, we get a peacock in Central Africa, franklins, and quails, all descendants, okay, sorry, um, the KFC that you're eating, all the chicken that you're eating is a descendant of the Indian gray jungle fowl. All domestic chickens today are descendants of the Indian gray jungle fowl. And they've been bred into a wide variety of forms. So, um, and they were, they were domesticated around 9,000 years ago in India. And of course, guinea fowl. So, Activia forms, which are busted and cool hunts, not related to ostriches, even though a lot of people think they are. Pelicaniforms, which are pelicans and herons which also include egrets, pelicans, and bitterns. The pickerforms, which are woodpeckers and barbets, and these include woodpeckers, barbets, wow, I think he's very late. And they include tinker birds, as well as honey guides. The participaticiforms, which are the greaves, people think they're related to, to, to ducks, so they're not actually related to ducks, they're on their own little mission in life. The procellaria forms, which are albatrosses, say that three times. Again, very similar to seagulls, but completely unrelated. Evolutionary convergence, two unrelated species, similar habitats, evolving to have similar appearances, like dolphins and sharks. Okay, and these guys include albatrosses, petrels, shearwaters, and storm petrels. If you're birders, you know these guys. If you're not birders, don't worry about them. They're just white and gray things that live out in the ocean. The satia forms, which are parrots, parakeets, and lovebirds. We quite, we're quite lucky that we've got quite a few of these, um, quite a nice variety of parrots in Africa. Striggy forms, which are not included in the other raptors, but are, are counted as raptors, owls. The suli forms, which are cormorants and gannets. We only get one species of gannet in South Africa. The trogoniform, including just one species in South Africa. In South America, there are dozens. The Narina trogon. And the passeriform, which accounts for half of all birds on Earth. There's around not, just under 10,000 species of birds on Earth. Over 5,000 of them are passerines, perching birds. And these include everything from crows to sparrows to larks to pipits and weavers. If it perches, it's, it's on this list. And we'll do this next lesson. And uh, we're going to just get more into the details of, of specific families. So next lesson, guys, we're going to be talking about the biology, the ecology, the fun facts of birds, uh, their behavior, foot structures, nest techniques, where eggs come from. They're not just magic. We can talk about the way they eat, the way they find their food. Um, and hopefully this is giving you a little bit more appreciation for birds. I know a lot of people don't give a damn about birds, but you're looking at tiny dinosaurs, effectively. They're cousins of velociraptors, they're cousins of dromaeosaurs. Their ancestors are based in amongst the allosaurus and tyrannosaurus rexes. They are creatures of murder and death. They're incredible. Um, and so if, if you're a guide and you people, if your guests are not interested in birds, tell them you're looking at tiny dinosaurs. If your kids are not interested in birds, tell them you're looking at tiny dinosaurs. And hopefully you'll be a lot more enthused to them in the future. So my books today were, um, as always, Evolution in Minutes, my nice go-to book, if I ever clued up or something. Uh, Animal Physiology, incredible book by Nut Schmidt Nielsen, Vertebrate Life, another one of my firm favorites. Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs, hard to find, but if you can get a copy, I have a hard copy I found it about a decade ago. I have no idea where to get it anywhere else, but you can buy it. Eat Around the Bush, everyone's got a copy of this. Uh, Robert's Bird Software, get the software instead of the book. The software has got so much more material than the book ever has. It's about 500 or 600 Rand, and you can get it from Robert's. Basic Biology and Nature.com and Wikipedia, always golden. Subscribe to them, read from them, learn from them, learn to love them. On that note, guys, we're going to wish you good night. If you have any pressing questions, you can WhatsApp me. If you haven't confirmed your email with me yet, please confirm because I'm going to be deleting a lot of unconfirmed emails because there's only about 30 people tonight. And those that are not confirmed emails will be deleted from the list and will not be invited back next week for the new messages. If you want to know anything that confused you, you can either wait until the Q&A on Saturday. Your next class is on Friday. Q&A is on Saturday. Um, but you can WhatsApp me if you have a question tonight. On that note, I feel Shane. Adios. Arrivederci. Bon voyage. Bye-bye. Lovely to chat to you all. Thanks for chopping in. Okay. Thank you so much as well for the lesson. I know it was a lot to take in, um, but my classes are always kind of shotgun blasts of machine gun rapid fire information. Learn what you want to learn, don't learn what you don't want to learn.
Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Okay, guys, take care. Hey?